This 76 Marshall JNP Master Model 50 Watt Mark II lead is a mouthful to say, but it's a really interesting amp. Right between the previous era's 1987 circuit, though that circuit was still in production until 1981, and the 77 2204, which is cascaded and became the JCM 800 that everyone knows and loves. Um, in 1976, the 100 watt, the 2203, got cascaded gain stages, but the 2204, the 50 watt, had two individual channels borrowed from the 1987, a normal and a high treble. The labels on the front here that you see are kind of misleading. But then those channels were mixed together and going to a single preamp gain pot. Uh, and due to the way it was built and forming voltage dividers, each channel had a lot less gain than a 1987 single channel. And even if you were to use an AB box and jumper and use both channels at once, you still had less gain than a jumper in 1987 and certainly a lot less gain than the cascaded 2203 100 watt. So in 1977, Marshall did add cascaded gain to the 2204 and has retained it all these years since. So the owner of the 76 asked if I could pretty please turn this into the cascaded gain 77. And I'm a really nice guy. So I said, sure, let's cascade this sucker. Step one is just to look at the amp as it came in and inspect everything. So here we have the Bulgan power socket. Uh, the amp's in great overall shape, uh, both cosmetically and in terms of the actual structure. Uh, the original Bulgan power connection is still good, and not a lot of them are. And the owner has a number of high quality built Bulgan cables, so he's good. Um, and the two fuse holders are still in excellent shape. Uh, a lot of them have the slots just absolutely torn up and worn out by people forcing the wrong screwdrivers into them over the years, but these are great. They're, they're tight, and each one has the proper fuse, which is crucial. One of the first things I check when amps come in is the fuse value. It's all too common for someone to say, I blew a fuse, so I put in this bigger fuse and it doesn't blow two fuses anymore. Well, if it was blowing a 2-amp fuse and you put in a 10-amp fuse, the fuse may not blow, but something inside may fail instead. I had one guy, a uh, poor bastard, brought in a Bogner Shiva that he lent to a friend, and his friend had put a 20-amp fuse in because it blew the, the fuse it's supposed to have, which I think is a 4- or 5-amp fuse. And uh, with that 20-amp fuse, it did not blow the fuse, but the whole amp caught on fire and was charred beyond recognition, let alone repair. So the, for that guy's former friend, that $1 wrong part killed a $3,000 amplifier. So that's the reason, that's the first thing I check on amps when they come into me. And I really urge you to check every fuse and every amp you own and make sure it is what it says it should be. Typically it's printed on the amp chassis. You may have to look at the service manual or look it up, but if it says four amps, don't put in a five amp. If it says two amps, don't put in a four amp. Get it right. If you're a tech, you know when you can fudge a little bit, you know, a six point, a six amp fuse instead of 6.3. But if you're not 100% sure of the current that's there, if you can't measure the current that's actually there, don't guess on fuses. Okay, continuing the inspection, we go to the mains voltage selector and output impedance selector. Now, these were not great designs, and Marshall later changed them to a much more rugged part that does the same thing. Um, most of the ones from the 70s that come in are falling apart. They're just barely holding together, very fragile. The plastic breaks, the metal gets fatigued. For whatever reason, the ones in this amp are in very good condition, are still making very good contact. I clean them and I tighten the pins just the slightest bit, but other than that, they're good to go. I left them as is. Uh, next thing I checked was the output jacks. Uh, these are still physically good, but it's very common, uh, especially for the cliff type jack, but even with the, the, the um, switchcrafts, the metal frames that people know from fenders, for metal fatigue to set in, especially if something has a jack in it a lot. Uh, the metal just loses its spring. It doesn't make enough forceful contact against the, the, uh, the, the uh, tip and sleeve of the, of the plug. And so as they lose strength, a speaker cable doesn't want to stay in. It can actually fall out. And if a speaker cable falls out while you're playing your 50-watt Marshall, you can lose $200, $400 worth of tubes. You can lose your output transformer. Things can catch on fire. It's a very bad thing. So I'm all for originality when possible. But when in doubt, uh, 
Never be afraid to change out a jack or have it change for one that's mechanically good because that's what's protecting your very expensive vintage output transformer. But luckily, these are fine. Okay, moving on to the power section end of things as the amp came in. Uh, aside from the 1K screen grid resistors on the output tube sockets, everything looks pretty much stock, but we're going to get into uh, a couple of particulars when we get to the detailed photos. And here's an overview of the rest of the amp as it came in. I, I knew I was going to be replacing the old bias capacitors, and um, the relatively few components needed to change it to cascade again and moving a few wires, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everything else uh, we wanted to remain stock as much as possible. Some exceptions to that. Um, there's a 47K resistor in the bias circuit and a 10K tail resistor in the phase inverter that are both uh, those nice light brown half watt uh, carbon films. So those are original to the amp, but they are not pyres and the owner wanted pyres. The owner has a stash of pyres. This is not a problem. So I'll be installing some pyres in those two spots. Um, the other thing that's pretty, that actually is important is the lead dress uh, going to the preamp tube sockets. And to an extent, the, the, the wires going to the tone stack and volumes were very sloppy and overlong. And excess is not your friend. Uh, if a wire from connected to one triode goes too close to a wire connected to another triode, you can get intermodulation, distortion, bleed, all kinds of fun stuff. So later I knew I'd be shortening the wire lengths. You want to leave enough slack that you can pull the board for future service and nothing's under stress, but you want to have any excess, real excess gone, and you want to steer all the wire, uh, the dress very neatly, keep the grids away from the heaters, etc., etc. We'll revisit this in a later photo. Okay, we're moving to the uh, output tube sockets as the amp came in. Uh, there's some discoloration on the chassis between the output tube sockets and the uh, 1K 5 watt screen grid resistors did not seem original, or if they were original, they had been removed at some point and then put back poorly. Uh, a couple dodgy solder joints on the output tube sockets, and uh, the amp originally did not have any grid stoppers on pin 5, and going to the cascaded gain is going to increase the gain of the amp substantially. So grid stoppers really are your friend there. They they keep out a whole bunch of noise and oscillation and outside interference from getting in your outputs. So it was a no-brainer since some Pyre 5.6Ks were on order. Okay, uh, moving on to check the power switches. Uh, this, both power and standby switches are original and are in good working order. I tightened them up a bit. They were a little bit loose in the, in the chassis and confirmed that the bias wire, which is the white wire connected to the standby switch, uh, was on the HT side of the connections. That's really important because a lot of marshals get that wrong. I don't know whether it was a design mistake because it did appear in some schematics incorrectly or whether it was just an inconsistency of whoever is doing the wiring of that amp on that day on that bench at the factory. But a lot of times they would connect the bias wire to the switched side of that so that when uh, the amp was in standby there was no bias voltage. And if you do it that way, when you turn the amp out of standby, for just a, a small number of milliseconds, there is power on the output tubes without there being uh, a bias voltage there uh, to keep them running under safe conditions. And especially with expensive old tubes, you don't want that. So I confirmed that the uh, bias wire is connected to the correct side, uh, the non-switch side, of the standby switch. So even when the amp is in standby, that bias circuit is working. Um, that's really important. Okay, moving on to the filter caps, and this is where it gets a little bit controversial. The amp has its original daily multi-section filter capacitors from 1976, and uh, that's well over the 10 to 15 year lifespan these were designed for. And usually if an amp has filter caps 15 years or older, I insist on replacing them. Um, the average guitarist really is better off changing them out. In this one isolated case, the owner is a collector. The owner is very knowledgeable about such things. He understands the risk he's taking. He's willing to take it anyway, and he knows what the early warning signs are. And he's willing to have them replaced as soon as hum increases or he gets a sour note or anything else. He's not going to wait till there's sm little smoke. So, he signed the waiver. I agreed that if these dailies were safe to use, uh, 
they could stay in the app. I know it sounds like I'm being a soup Nazi, but it's, I, I really feel strong about this because I've seen people lose tons of money and, and sometimes very valuable transformers because of bad filter caps. But with all that out of the way, and this is not my normal uh, practice, I agreed that I would bring these dailies up very slowly on a, um, a variac with a current limiter and a current meter and all that over a period of multiple hours. And they seemed to be okay. They could last another five years. They could last another five weeks. There's no way of knowing. But right now they are okay, and he's happy about that. So that's where we're at with the uh, filter caps. Um, what you can't see in the photo is what I did for all three filter caps. Uh, one's hidden beneath the board. You don't see it in the photos. I, I removed the nut and toothed washer on the ground connections for each cap and thoroughly cleaned both the chassis and the hardware. Uh, over time, brass contacting tin, contacting steel, etc., leads to chemical reactions to due to dissimilar metals being in contact. Uh, and the ground connections literally can corrode. I got the minor corrosion off, uh, made sure all surfaces were clean, and then put them back together really tightly. Uh, this can make a huge difference in how an app sounds, especially a Marshall where we're going to be increasing the gain. This was originally going to be just the one video on the valuation and the changes, but it, it obviously went long. Uh, so part one that you've just watched is evaluating the amp as it came in and all the things that I knew I needed to do and the considerations and things to, to look for in Marshalls. And part two will be the actual changes to the Cascade Gain uh, 77 era uh, 2204. So look for that.